This is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh? Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalhungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. Each year, Equal Pay Day is recognized and supported by advocates to generate awareness about the national gender pay gap. At an Equal Pay Day event, Vice President Kamala Harris talked about the pay gap of Native women. That when you raise the economic status of women, you raise the economic status of families, of communities, and all of society benefits. And so that is the spirit with which we approach this, which is, it is not only about fairness and equity for that individual working person, it is to the benefit of in the entire society. Um, I don't need to tell this group, but I'll say it for the sake of, of the friends who are joining us. On average, women make 82 cents of what men make, 82 cents on the dollar. Black women, 63 cents. Native women, 60 cents, Hispanic women, 55, and Asian American, 87 percent, or 80 cents on the dollar. So when we look at the issue, we also see the interconnection between race and gender, um, which is something that is not only about equal pay, but many other issues that we need to address and we do collectively address. Shannon Williams of the Equal Rights Advocates says the wage gap adds up to well over a million dollars over the course of an indigenous woman's career. The North Central Montana Human Trafficking and Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Task Force is gearing up for the Red Sand Project. Volunteers in Great Falls, Montana will hand out red sand and provide information about human trafficking next Wednesday, March 31st and April 1st. People are encouraged to pour the red sand into the cracks of sidewalks to represent those who have fallen through the cracks by either being trafficked or have been murdered or gone missing. The Red Sand Project was started in 2014. It's estimated 40.3 million people around the world are victims of human trafficking. Many women involved in the sex trafficking identify as Native women. The average age a person is forced into trafficking is 13 years old. The Yochadihi Wintu Nation in Northern California wants cannabis growers to move away from Cape Valley, where the tribe is located. Among their reasons for wanting the move, is that there are indigenous artifacts in the area. The Yochadihi Winton want to protect those items in Yoba County. Tribal Chairman Anthony Roberts released a statement saying the current situation is unworkable. Yolo County Supervisor Oscar Viegas says they are in support of finding a solution for all parties. The nation estimates that it will cost around $10 million to move the entire operation and buy the land. And they say they are willing to put their money where their mouth is and pay for that move. Another meeting on the issue is set for May. One tribe in North Dakota is opening up a new location for some of the first responders. The Mandan Hidatsa Arikara Nation made the announcement this week. The new location will house both Mandarese Emergency Medical Services and the Fire Department. By teaming up, they can continue to save lives in the community. Already, the Mandarese Fire Chief says response time response times for rural areas used to be 30 minutes and now those times are being cut in half. The medical director, Dr. Robert Benji Kitagawa, says that while revenue isn't there yet, he hopes to make the EMS self-sufficient in years to come. The Spokane City Council in Washington is acknowledging the first people of the region. The council unanimously adopted a land acknowledgement that recognizes the Spokane tribe of Indians as the ancestral stewards of Spokane Falls and the surrounding land. The resolution also calls for the appointment of an official liaison between the indigenous people and also the city of, of Spokane. The land acknowledgement is the second gesture the city has made in recent months to reconcile with the history of Native Americans who were displaced in the Spokane region. Sharice Davids, one of the first two Native American women to be elected to Congress, is coming out with a children's book. The Democrat from Kansas titled her book, Sharice's Big Voice, A Native Kid Becomes a Congresswoman. She describes herself as a little girl who liked to talk, but she also learned to listen. Her life is described in the book, being raised by a single mother who was in the military, and the values her mother taught her. She also writes about being a lesbian, her love of martial arts, and graduating from law school. She shares advice for kids and lessons she's learned throughout her life. The book also includes some history about her Ho-Chunk tribe. Sharice's Big Voice will be published in June. And those are the stories from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tholohungva. 
When we come back, the high rate of incarceration for Native people. Mark, it's even been called the womb to prison pipeline. That's right, Patty. And we'll be talking about a few projects that are geared to changing the system. We'll be right back. This is a stunning number. More than 60% of juveniles held in federal custody are Native Americans. Incredible. They serve sentences far longer than other juveniles for similar offenses, according to the Department of Justice Indian Law and Order Commission. Today, we have Stephanie Autumn, who's the Executive Director of the American Indian Prison Project Working Group. The project was founded in 1986 and the mission is centered on changing the political, social, education, economic, and justice systems that have created the womb to prison pipeline. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you, Mark. Good to be here today. Let's start with just kind of an overview of the situation. Um, in terms of not only the impact of incarceration on our indigenous people here in the US, it's really important to frame it in terms of the country that we live in. Um, today, the US is, has the largest prison population in the world and the highest per capita rate. Um, in 2018, there were 698 people incarcerated per 100,000. In 2019, there were over 1,435,500 people in prison. And that's really hard for me to comprehend. Um, in 2020, um, our census, there were approximately 3.18 million native people. Um, so we're less than 1% of the population, but in states like Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, Montana, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, Idaho, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Minnesota, South Dakota, and North Dakota, we represent our relatives, men, women, and our youth can sometimes represent up to 20 to 35% of that incarcerated population in state, federal, and um, county facilities. That's an important context. Uh, how, how do we begin to change that? Over the years, because I'm that old, I used to always think dominant society, the federal government, the states had to change it. And yes, they are, they are the largest part of it because incarceration started, started hundreds of years ago. Indigenous people, we were the, the first prisoners. We have forts all over this country that represent our incarceration, our incarceration relationship with this federal government. So how do we begin to change it is we start to collect data. That's one of the largest missing pieces in terms of being able to develop effective, sustainable strategies to decarcerate our tribal nations, our tribal people to stop being the dollar bills, the quarters that pay for federal and state prisons and private prisons that now are really more run like a business and depend on us indigenous people and people of color to fund the functioning of those federal and state institutions. So tribal nations, tribal leaders, tribal communities, we need to know what, how incarceration is impacting us. We need to learn about incarceration from pickup to sentencing. We need to be able to um, really stand on our sovereignty in terms of knowing and knowing the data of um, who's in state prisons, who's in federal prisons, um, and when they'll be returned to our communities. So we have a lot of work to do in our own home community. And it's also tied to resources. Doing this work is all encompassing. And I always recommend um, anywhere I go in Indian country, that tribal leadership and community leadership look at funding tribal liais liaisons, not funded by the state or federal government, 
because then you really can't do your work, really needs to be funded by tribes or other resources so that we could really support our, our relatives, male, female, um, two-spirited, our youth that um, are being housed, detained, incarcerated, and most importantly, coming home. Wow, there's um, so much there. I think in terms of resources, of course, there's the human dimension of making sure people return home, but also what an incredible waste of, of government resources. Instead of actually building a community, they're um, splitting a community. Thank you, Mark, for that little lead in. Um, so I do a lot of research around incarceration um, from you know, and in terms of indigenous philosophy and our approaches for when there's harm in our community. And I've researched, you know, we can look anywhere in some of the, the most recent research of um, state and federal agencies in terms of what they've learned. They've learned that punishment is not a deterrent to crime, but we continue to, they continue to practice that model that somehow um, incarcerating and punishing individuals will create that change. But as indigenous people, we know that um, a harm or a crime only represents a portion of that human being. It isn't who they are in totality. And in our indigenous communities, we look at the strengths of all of our relatives. And if we can look at those strengths and couple them with healing resources, um, Western therapy really utilize our resources in a way that gets to the root of the problem, then we can start to see change in terms of decreasing the number of our relatives going into state and federal facilities. Um, one of the most important things to look at when you look at the ma mass incarceration in the United States is in terms of the largest number of crimes that um, people are being held in prison for, people are being incarcerated for addiction and substance abuse. The United States government is trying to incarcerate poverty. The United States government is incarcerating trauma. You know, it doesn't take anyone with any type of degree to know that is not a good strategy to create healthy and well and safe communities. There's alternatives to detention that our people have employed for thousands and thousands of years. And that's part of what the American Indian Prison Project tries to employ not only in the areas we live, but going into other communities and training other communities to really build a grassroots initiative um, to support our relatives that are in prison. One of the things I've always been struck by is not just the prison side of the equation, but also the fees and all of the barriers that uh, is placed on somebody coming back to a community where just getting back to normal is really a tough, a normal life is really a tough haul. Yes, um, unfortunately for our people, I mean, <clears throat> when you look at the demographics and the data that is shared on a state and federal level, we don't even show up most of the time. So if you use that equation that we're invisible, apply it to resources available for our people inside prison and when they return home, there's little to nothing to support our, our um, people in returning and the, um, the state and federal systems place um, unrealistic unmanageable requirements on our relatives turning home, finding a job within 60 days, housing, um, you know, all of those things, paying back child support, um, doing drug testing twice a week, probably if someone lives on Pine Ridge and they have to get to Rapid City and they don't have a vehicle, they can be violated for not getting to their drug testing. But another critical part of what we're seeing in our communities, we know that um, how important and how um, our relationship is to each other. Most of our relatives are placed in locations where families can't travel. They don't have that ability. Um, our people incarcerated and our families don't have access to phones, don't have access to computers. So sometimes when I think about our relatives in prison, not only are they incarcerated behind an iron cage, they're incarcerated because of poverty issues, lack of technology issues. And, and we really do need to name 
claim um, why we as indigenous people based on our population are the largest group in, um, incarcerated in the United States. It's tied to broader issues of racism, um, access to our resources, access to our land. Um, what got me on this pathway a long time ago, again, I was doing research and Times had an article on incarceration in the United States, and they actually included our people. And there was a project projection that in 2050, not too far from here, that if the incarcer incarceration rate continued um, for indigenous men and, and youth, we would have more men and youth incarcerated in state and federal prisons than we would in our own homes. And just want to mention that Thank Native you. women are the fastest rising um, group being incarcerated now in the United States. Extraordinary. Thank you so much, Stephanie Autumn. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Indian Country Today, for allowing me to, um, to share about this important issue. We'll be right back with a look at March Madness and more. Colby Kicking Woman is our resident sports expert. He's keeping an eye on teams and tournaments, and he joins us today to talk about a few things. Welcome, Colby. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me today. So this is March, and it's an unusual March, but uh, wh where do we stand? Well, for both uh, the women's and men's tournaments, we are now uh, into this, heading into the Sweet uh, 16 and Elite Eight this weekend. Uh, and yeah, it's just nice to have the tournament back after last year. Uh, the COVID pandemic, you know, really shut the world down and especially the sports world down. Uh, and so there were no tournaments. And so there's a lot of excitement. And uh, the men are up in Indiana, having it all in kind of the Indianapolis area, um, kind of a bubble and the women are in Texas. But it's been an uh, exciting first weekend for sure. Who do you like so far? What are some of the things? What are the highlights? Uh, who do I, well, I think the, the whole country likes Gonzaga, um, you know, Back in the early 2000s, they were the, the big Cinderella team that, that constantly crashed brackets, but they've been a, a powerhouse for some time. Uh, a lot of basketball pundits say that this is Mark Few's uh, best team he's ever had. Um, I think an overwhelming majority of the nation had Gonzaga to, to uh, win their bracket. I did. Um, so I went kind of upset heavy in, in the early rounds to try to make up some points in, in some bracket pools um, that I'm in. But, um, you know, there's always some upsets. Oral Roberts has made a, a run to the Sweet 16. Uh, they're a university in uh, o Tulsa, Oklahoma. And one of the things, you know, I find fun every year is you kind of do a little research into these smaller schools who, who don't really get a lot of uh, national attention during the year. And turns out Oral Roberts is uh, uh, the guy who founded the university is a is of Cherokee and Choctaw, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, he is a member of those tribes. Um, he passed away in 2009, but you know, it's a little fun little fact that I found out. Uh, I, there was an interesting story in the Wall Street Journal this week that uh, the women can't actually use the phrase March Madness. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you saw that, but the NCAA trademarked it and is applying it only to the men. No, no, I did not see that, but uh, there has been a lot of news about uh, just kind of what's going on down in the women's tournament. They uh, the lack of a weight room and uh, compared to the men's, um, I'm sure you've seen the picture that went viral. That was just a little set of dumbbells, uh, whereas the men pretty much have a full gym uh, and even even down to the food. Um, it's one of those things, you know, especially in the social media age, uh, things like that are, are, are going to get out. Um, and so you, you'd think that the NCAA would be uh, a little bit better about keeping it equal, especially, you know, March is, you know, Women's History Month and, and all that. Who are the teams to watch in the, on the women's side of the ledger? On the women's side, um, you know, there's such there's a big, uh, I would say, a big tier between the top teams and and everyone else. Um, every year, you know, Stanford, Baylor, uh, UConn, um, South Carolina always always fields a really good team. Um, Oregon always seems to have a really good team. There was a couple a couple upsets, uh, but th those number one seeds um, have a really good shot. 
I, I was uh, um, Idaho State had to take Kentucky in the first round and um, held them fairly well for a little while. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the fun. That's the fun thing, right? Is um, you know, whenever the University of Montana, my alma mater, and, and home state makes it into the tournament, I always try to pick them for an upset or two. And you know, it just gives you a, a, a little bit of pride in, in, in where you come from and your home teams. And, and it's always fun to, to root for it, have a little skin in the game, if you will. Well, and as you know, in a town like Pocatello or Missoula, if you do win, it stays with you forever. <laughs> oh, e exactly. I, I still remember when uh, the Grizz beat Nevada back, you know, I must have been in eighth grade or, or, or something like that. And, and, you know, they just won one game in the tournament, but that made all the difference. Same here with Idaho State and UCLA. Um, I want to switch gears. Uh, you covered a Supreme Court uh, hearing coming up this, this week. Uh, talk about that for a minute. Yeah, so on Tuesday, the Supreme Court heard the United States versus uh, Cooley. Uh, it involved a uh, case also in Montana, actually, uh, with the Crow tribe, uh, with a Crow uh, tribal police officer who pulled over, uh, didn't pull over. He was driving on a, on a highway that goes through the Crow Reservation, and there was a, a truck pulled over on the side of the road with his headlights still on. So he, uh, the court documents said, you know, in the past, it was he wasn't unfamiliar with coming across people that needed help uh, in the area. So he turned around, went to check on him, uh, and it turned into um, he ended up detaining the man Joshua Cooley and uh, found uh, methamphetamine and guns in the car. Uh, he was eventually arrested and charged in, in federal court, uh, but appealed to have uh, the evidence that was found by the Crow tribal police officer dismissed, uh, which the Ninth Circuit um, held up, and now it's at the Supreme Court and. Uh, what's fascinating to me about these telephonic uh, hearings in the Supreme Court is how fast they go. And, you know, you hear from every uh, every justice and it's just bam, 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 question after question. You know, they only have a couple minutes uh, to, to ask what's on their mind. And, and it's very fast paced. Well, the outcome of this uh, case is really important to tribal law enforcement. Absol absolutely. Um, especially as it comes to, you know, they're often as... Uh, I forget who was uh, the lawyer's name uh, who was representing the government, uh, but you know, tribal police officers are often the first responders, and you know they're responsible for everybody's safety on the reservation, whether they're you know natives and non-natives alike. And so, a lot of the a lot of the justices pose questions on hypotheticals. You know, what if what if hypothetically speaking, what if the man resembled uh, you know a bolo for, for a serial killer? Does he have the right to detain him then? Uh, and so and so it seemed. Uh, and uh, we have an article on our website that, that the justices might uh, side uh, with the Crow Tribal Chairman and Tribal Police Officers being able to detain non-natives. Colby Kicking Woman, thank you. Appreciate it, Mark. And you can find Colby Kicking Woman's story at IndianCountryToday.com. Now, for a story of lost regalia, a treasured family headdress that turned up 15 years later. Here's a story from our partners at APTN. Tina House shows us how social media played a big role in this story. It all started when Harry Warner came to this garbage bin to look for bottles. But this time, he found something with much more significance. I saw a bag in here. So I was just seen a feather stick and I went and I grabbed the bag. And what Warner found was this headdress. But who did it belong to? He says he brought it back home to his roommate and they decided to post on Facebook to find the owner. So many people wanted to claim it, it was theirs. There was people that were telling me that it's theirs and we told them if you can give us um, a description, uh, what it is, uh, what are all on it, uh, what was used to th thread with it. Uh, but a lot of them came up with nothing. They didn't have pictures. Ron Baker's niece in northern B.C. saw the post and called her family after she recognized that it had belonged to the late Kotlachaw, Chief Simon Baker of the Squamish Nation. He had given it to his son Ron, but Ron says it had been stolen about 15 years ago from the Aboriginal Friendship Centre. When I was looking at the picture on Facebook and I'm looking across my living room at my pictures and I go, Hey, that's my address. <laughs> After verifying Ron Baker as the rightful owner, a repatriation ceremony was organized to return it. Ron's sister, Faye Hull, says she's so happy the headdress is finally home. I really wish these feathers could talk. 
about the journey where it's been in the last 15 years or so because it's in perfect condition. Whoever looked, had it respected it and looked after it. Faye says this isn't the first time things have returned to the family. These carvings were found in an antique store that their dad had carved in the 1940s. And this basket is one of nine that was returned to them after meeting someone who had them at an art show in Santa Fe, New Mexico. What else is remarkable is that the dumpster where the headdress was found was only a half a block away from where Faye and Ron live. And as Faye puts the sacred headdress on her brother, Ron explains what it's like to be reunited with this precious gift from his late father. Every time you put a headdress on, it just gives you an overwhelming feeling. All, all your troubles go away. You're in your own world and you're showing your own power. Tina House, APTN National News, North Vancouver. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. We will be back with another edition tomorrow. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. Indian Country Today is produced at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. This is Indian Country Today.